All right, the recording has started. The mic is working. We can begin. Uh, today, we're going to jump right into a problem-solving session <clears throat> regarding reactions. Uh, I do expect you to have your solubility table uh, as well as the table with the reactions on them, the different uh, types, comments, examples. We will be referring back to them quite a bit. We're quickly find them for you. They're also on Canvas if you have your tablet. <clears throat> Reactions 101 and solubility rules. These are the two that I would like you to have access slash quickly refer to. All right. <clears throat> I'm going to add this to the document so that way I can uh, after. Yeah, okay. So that way we can quickly refer to it. All right. So just to give you an idea of how today's problem session is gonna go, because it's, it's kind of two parts. Uh, first, we're gonna do a couple of the targeted problems on the sheet. <clears throat> and then we're definitely gonna try to do a lot of problem three, which is the actual predicting the products and all that stuff. Uh, but problem four onwards requires something called ionic equations. Uh, that is something we will also go through today. So after the first half of the problem solving session, we're going to go into a proper like lecture, and then we're going to immediately do some problems on it. Uh, and don't worry, I do not expect us to finish this document today in general. Uh, I do, I do expect that we're going to have some of it to do on Thursday's class as well. All right. So. Let's start with problem one. This is just a couple of solubility questions. Uh, you are being asked to identify the following compounds as soluble or insoluble, aka uh, soluble is AQ as in aqueous and insoluble is solid. So identify if a molecule is solid or aqueous, you always refer to the solubility rules table. These are the only rules I need you to know for this class. If you Google solubility rules online, you will get a much bigger table uh, full of chemicals that I do not need you to know. So always refer to this particular document. You're supposed to read it as if though the, 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 the title of each column is a part of the sentence. So for example, if we were to look at the first one, uh, we would read it as if the, group, if the compound contains a group one cation, then it is soluble except when bonded to a, well, no exceptions, right? <clears throat> so it needs to be read left to right, and you can see that I've uh, also identified soluble and insoluble as aqueous and <clears throat> solid. Okay, so we're going to keep referring back to this. I do expect you all to have the document at the ready because I, I don't want to keep, like, flipping back and forth and confusing people. So let us start with the first one. Silver sulfate. So follow along on your solubility rules. If the compound contains A, uh, sulfate, I believe, is in the third or fourth row. I can also be just bring it up on my phone. That way I don't, that way I don't actually say the wrong thing. C or C. And that's how good. All right, I'm looking at the, the, the third row of the solubility table, just to make sure everyone understands where we are. I'm gonna quickly scroll and show that we're right here. So if the compound contains a sulfate, then it is soluble. These are the only exceptions. You can see here that one of the exceptions is AG, aka silver, and that's what we have bonded in the molecule. So in other words, Sulfates are typically soluble, except when bonded to silver. As a result, it is solid. Let's apply the same logic to a couple of rows down. We're looking at BAS. I've highlighted it so you can catch it. <clears throat> You should be able to recognize pretty quickly that there is barium two plus as well as sulfur two minus. Looking at the solubility rules table, sulfides are in the last row, the absolute last row. 
If the compound contains a sulfur ion, then it is insoluble. By default, it is solid, except in those cases, you can see one of the exceptions is barium, Ba. Showing here again, if the compound contains a sulfur, then it is solid. One of the exceptions is barium, which is exactly what we have in this case. So BAS is aqueous. All right, let's do Hg2Cl2, again highlighted so you can follow it. <clears throat> Rather quickly, you identify here in this case that mercury is a transition metal. So while we do not know the exact charge of it right now, we do know that it's going to be uh, positive. I do not know if it's two plus, one plus or whatever, but I do know it's gonna be some cation. I've simply written X to symbolize that. Quite frankly, we do not care what the charge is. Charge doesn't help us identify if it's soluble or not. So you've identified there be mercury. You also identify that there's chlorine present. Looking at the solubility table, we're looking at row two. The compound contains a chlorine ion. Therefore, it is soluble. However, one of the exceptions is mercury, Hg2. If you're having trouble uh, finding it on the solubility table, please tell me. Once more, the compound contains a chlorine. Therefore, it is aqueous. Sorry. Oh, wait, sorry. I looked at the wrong one. Yeah, aqueous. These are the only exceptions. I apologize. I looked at the wrong row. Happens to me. These are the only exceptions which is not met here. Therefore, this is aqueous. I would like you all to try the following. LiClO3, so the very last row in the first column. And I'll highlight the rest. So four questions in total. Take two more minutes. All right, <clears throat> starting us off, 
lithium ClO3. ClO3 is the first row. It's part of that first row. Uh, this is one of those options that are always soluble. There are no exceptions. <clears throat> so the lithium chlorate is aqueous. <clears throat> Next up, we have sodium carbonate. The carbonate is, in general, solid. However, it is bonded to a group one cation, sodium. Therefore, in this case, it is aqueous. NaCl, by the same uh, code of logic, uh, it is attached to chlorine minus, which is generally soluble, aqueous. Of course, you may have also used the logic, well, I know sodium chloride to be salt. I know that salt dissolves in water. I know it's therefore aqueous. Whatever logic you use is fine. And finally, we have PBI2. Uh, we have an iodine minus, which is, which is generally aqueous. However, it is attached to PB, aka lead. Therefore, in this particular case, it is solid. Okay. Does anyone have any questions on how we uh, determine whether they're soluble or not? Yes. Uh, the the packet is down there at that first uh, bench, right beside Margaret. Okay, let's move on then. I'll wait for the others to get their documents. Yes, you are expected to memorize it. Yes. So again, I'll just uh, answer that question. The solubility rules table, you are expected to memorize because you will be, you need to identify if things are soluble or aqueous on the exam. You do not need to memorize reactions 101, this document. This is just a guide, just a little handout to help you organize your thoughts on what they are. Okay, we're moving on to problem two. Uh, we're balancing the reactions. Please know that I have already provided all of the necessary state symbols. Uh, I have already predicted the products. The sole focus of this section is to, is to balance. Uh, you also notice under each reaction, I provided you with the following aids. It's to force you to, uh, to, do, to, to take the step-by-step -step method like we did. But ultimately speaking, these are optional. These are these forced guides or aids. If you can do it in your head, by all means, do it. <clears throat> so let's start with the first one. Zoom in a bit. Uh, we have here C3H8, which reacts with O2 to form CO2 and water. So counting all of our atoms on the left and right side, we have three carbons on the left, eight hydrogens, and two oxygens. That's how much we currently have right now. On the right hand side, we have one carbon, three ox, I'm sorry, two hydrogens and three oxygens. Do you know that the three oxygens come from, two of them are in uh, CO2 and there is one in H2O. So in total, there are three. You can pick whichever element you want to start with. Uh, I would say the worst one to start with is oxygen, simply because it occurs or is it, is it present in multiple areas. So what I'm trying to say is, you know, try to find something that is, that is unique that you can control. In this case, let's start with carbon. There are three carbons on the left. There's only one on the right. Uh, to appropriately balance that, we simply put a three in front of the CO2. We now have three carbons, but in so doing, we have now increased the number of oxygens. Remember, we know that there are in general two oxygens in CO2, but we're stating, we're clearly stating that there are three of those molecules in total. Therefore, there are six oxygens over here and still one on the right. Now we have seven oxygens. We have balanced carbon. Now we can move on to hydrogen. Hydrogen is also a pretty simple case. If there are eight on the left, to balance it, we put a four. 
in front of the H tool. In doing so, we now have eight hydrogens on the left and on the right. And we have unintentionally increased the number of oxygens again. So we have three times two, so we have six. And now we have four oxygens from the water. Six plus four gives us 10. We have balanced hydrogen, we have balanced hydrogen. And in the last case for oxygen, this one's just as simple as putting a five in front of the O2. Okay, does anyone have any questions on this? Okay, let's do the next one. We have here AgNO3, sodium chloride forming AgCl and NaNO3. The packets are down on that bench over there. <clears throat> so from left to right, we have one Ag, aka one mercury, uh, silver. Note that I have separated the NO3. But you should know that NO3 typically exists as a polyatomic ion. So I have purposely put this as, an ink, as a typo, hoping that you would recognize instead we would write NO3 minus it is a polyatomic ion. It is a single unit. You can also immediately see in the product that it maintains its polyatomic status. So it's easier overall. Therefore, we know there's one on the left, one sodium, one chlorine. Keep it going on the right. We have one silver, one NO3, minus one sodium and one chlorine. The reaction as is, is balanced. Oh, sorry. Uh, actually, I clicked the lock button. Great. All right, we're back. Do we have any questions on this one? Okay. Let's move on. Please attempt the first, first one on your own. This one might be a little tricky. So I'll give you a, let's say a total of three minutes. Ultimately speaking, as long as you balance the reaction correctly, it doesn't matter the approach you take. You can use my aids, you can come up with your own, you can do it in your head. The correct answer is a correct answer. Take another minute.
Nine twenty-two. Let's attack it. Okay. Here again, we have the situation where we do have a polyatomic ion, and I have separated the atoms. And just as before, you would say, well, why don't we just combine it together, right? It's a polyatomic ion. We see it clearly over here. We also see it right here. But some of you may have also noticed there is an OH, which is technically also a polyatomic ion. It's OH minus. Now you're stuck because you're saying, well, I don't, I don't see OH over here at all. Again, compare that to NO3, which is also a polyatomic ion, which is, which is kept or at least maintained. What about the OH? You know, where did it go? How does this affect us? The truth, is, the truth is it didn't go anywhere. H2O is a, is a summary of HOH. So the OH is still there. We just simplify this formula to H2O. So again, the NO3 is a polyatomic ion and it maintains its polyatomic status. In the same way, the OH maintains its polyatomic status and uh, it's just written as H2O. With that in mind, we can make some changes to our guides to help us out. NO3 and HO. I'm putting the charges just to help remind you what they are. All right. From left to right, <coughs> starting with uh, hydrogen, there is one hydrogen. There is one NO3. There is one potassium and there is one OH. On the right hand side, we have one potassium, one nitrate, one hydrogen, and one OH. So just as before, the reaction as is, is already balanced. I'll work through the, the next one, number four. Aluminum and copper chloride gives you aluminum trichloride and a single copper. <clears throat> On the left-hand side, we have one aluminum, one copper, and two chlorines. On the right-hand side, we have one aluminum, one copper, and three chlorines. So obviously the big bad here is the chlorine. That's the one we need to balance. So we obviously start with that. Now, 2, 3 is kind of awkward. There is no single number that you can multiply by 2 to get 3 because we generally avoid fractions. So you start looking, uh, <clears throat> you look for what's called the lowest common multiple. Between 3 and 2, the lowest common multiple LCM is equal to 6. That is 3 times 2. That is how you tell the lowest common multiple. So that's how much we're aiming for on either side to be equal. On the left-hand side, we have two chlorines. We put a three in front of the copper chloride. This now makes it six chlorines. In the same way, we put a two in front of the aluminum chloride. In doing so, we now have six chlorines. We set out to balance the chlorines, but we've intentionally messed things up. We've now changed the amount of aluminum and copper, so we need to adjust. We still have one aluminum on the left. We have three coppers. We have two aluminums on the right and only one copper. So we've balanced chlorine, but at what cost? Everything's now out of sync. <clears throat> That's no worry though, we can keep it going. Just because I see it first, let's do copper. We have three coppers on the left, 
one on the right, and we just put a three in front of it. This balances the copper and it doesn't affect anything else. And finally, there are two aluminums on the right. There's only one on the left. So we simply put a two in front. And that balances it. All right. With that, I would like you all to try the fifth one. Do know that there are two polyatomic ions actually present. Excuse me. Take three more minutes. Take another minute. <clears throat> Okay, 
932. We recognize with some uh, swiftness that there are polyatomic ions present. So instead of using the letters or rather the, 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 the elements, we are going to group them together. Makes, us, makes it easier for us overall. All right, we have an NO3 presence as well as an SO4. NO3 and SO4. All right, on the left-hand side, we have one barium. We have two nitrates, because it's in brackets. We also have two sodiums and one sulfate on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, again, we have one barium. We have one nitrate. We have one sodium. And finally, we have one sulfate. Obviously, the sodium and the nitrate are uh, the problem. Picking one to begin with, I see sodium first. Let's do that. Uh, there are two sodiums on the left. There's one on the right. Uh, so we put two in front of the product side. In doing so, we have increased the number of sodiums and unintentionally also increased the number of nitrates. With that, sodium is balanced. But thanks to sweet serendipity, you have actually also just balanced the nitrates. And of course, the barium and the sulfate were fine to begin with. Any questions on this one? Okay. You guys have a lot more practice with the rest of this problem. Uh, let's now move on to problem three. We're looking at page uh, page four. Okay. This is what your next exam is going to look like. Almost exactly. Pretty much the exact same instructions, the exact same setup with the tables, almost exactly the same thing. <clears throat> For it to have a complete balanced equation, let's just check off the things we must include. First of all, we must have the correct products. It must also be correctly balanced. And of course, it must include the relevant slash correct state symbols. These are the three things necessary for complete and full credit for each one of these. If, for example, each one of these is one point, that means each reaction is worth three points. I can ask you up to 50 reactions. <clears throat> okay, let's do this. Before, we, before I forget, the reactions 101 table, it would be a good idea to have this up because I'm gonna draw attention to it every now and again. Most notably, the last, the very, very last row titled displacement. Uh, I've given here a few generic reactions. I, I've, I've corrected the typo that Sarah found last week. Uh, so these are the generic reactions that we are going to use to predict the products. I'm gonna take a quick screenshot of this, that way we have it handy. All right. All right, so I'm, I just have it at the bottom of the page because uh, I couldn't find any other space. All right, before we move on, I would just like to point out the difference between the first two sentences right here. In both cases, you have a single element reacting with a compound, and that single element displaces the compound. However, 
that single element, depending on the charge it forms, affects the order in which you write the letters. So just keep that in mind. And then finally, we have a double displacement, which all the compounds just displace each other. No need to worry about kata and anion. Okay. Looking at the first problem, problem 3A, you should have a better handle on uh, your polyatomic ions. So you should be able to quickly identify this as, use a different color, A, B plus C, D. Meaning you should be able to recognize that ion A is lithium, ion B is the hydroxide or OH, C is barium, and of course, the ion D is chlorine. We, now, we also know that the products resemble the following form, A, D plus C, B. So we're going to use this format to just put them together. All we're doing is putting the elements together. We are not concerned about superscript, subscript, or charges. All we're doing right now is putting them together. So based on our designation, AD is lithium chloride, L-I-C-L. All I've done is put the elements together. I don't care about numbers just yet. Following the same pattern, CB is B-A-O-H. Please note the order in which I've written this. You might be wondering why isn't CB alphabetical? Do note that C is the cation, and cations are always written first. Now that we've predicted the products with some, with some amount of confidence, we can now make sure that the numbers are balanced, meaning are these the correct formula? Looking at the first one, lithium and chloride, lithium is in group one, therefore it forms plus one. Chlorine is in group seven, so it forms Cl minus. As is, this is five. Crisscross still leads you to one, one. I have accidentally made the correct product. That's good. Moving on to the next one. Barium is in group two. So barium has a charge of two plus. However, if you look at your, uh, your polyatomic ions table, you will notice that OH is negative one. So these are not balanced as is. So using the crisscross method, we know that there is one barium and technically there are two hydroxides. Okay. With that, all we have done is correctly identify the products. That's all the credit you've gotten so far. After a while with, with forced repetition and practice, you'll be, you'll, be get, you'll be predicting the products in less than 10 seconds. Okay. We also now need to worry about balancing. Going through the list, uh, starting with lithium, there is one lithium on the left, one on the right. One barium on the right, uh, one barium, sorry, one barium on the left, one on the right, check. But the issue now is number one, you have one hydroxide on the left, but two on the right side. Similarly speaking, you have two chlorines on the left and only one on the right. Do note, I'm not giving you space for those, uh, those guides that we used before. So if you'd like to draw use it yourself, you're free to. Uh, starting with OH, because I saw it first, if there's two on the right, then all we need to do is just put a two on the left. Okay, OH is balanced. <clears throat> Next up, we have chlorine. There's only one on the right, and there's two on the left. We just put a two in front of it. All right. 
So the problematic ones were the OH and the CL. We are presumably balanced. Let's just double check to make sure everything else makes sense. There are two lithiums on the left, two lithiums on the right. Check. There are two OHs on the left. There are two OHs on the right. Check. There is one barium on the left, one barium on the right. Check. There are two chlorines on the left, two chlorines on the right. Check. And this is a completely balanced equation. That's your second point. Finally, we must include state symbols. I've helped you out by identifying the state symbols of the reactants already. So you just need to identify the state symbols of the products. So now let's bring out our solubility table. We're gonna first start with the chlorine species. If the, mol if the compound contains a chlorine, so we're looking at the second row, then it is usually soluble. The only exceptions are silver and lead, neither of which are present here. Therefore, lithium chloride is aqueous. Next up, we have barium hydroxide. Hydroxide, which is the last row of the table. Last row of the table says that OHs are generally insoluble. One of the exceptions is barium. Therefore, it is aqueous. And with that, that is your final answer. You've gotten full credit. From this answer, I can see that you've identified the correct products, you've correctly balanced, and you've correctly included the state symbols. The exam will have instructions very similar to this. Okay. Uh, let's do let's do D as in dog. Let's do D as in dog. Okay. Unlike A as an apple, one of the first things you should notice is that this does not follow the general A, B plus C, D thing we just had. Why? Because on the left-hand side, we do not have A, B. In fact, we just have A. We have a single element. So this is more accurately A plus B, C. This is one of those generic reactions provided. So again, scrolling down to the bottom. These are the products. And we have to know what type of ion A will form. So let me just go back up to confirm. I see aluminum labeled as A. Is aluminum going to be a cation or an anion? Aluminum is in group three. So it has a charge of plus three, therefore it will be a cation, okay? According to the rules, this is a reaction you follow when A is a cation. A, C, plus B. So that's how I know which generic reaction to use. Again, scrolling down, we identify that aluminum can form a cation. So that is the product we follow, the template. Putting this all together, we're just gonna match things up. Uh, A and C is aluminum and chlorine. And then of course, uh, the, the last element is left on its by itself, in this case, Cu copper. We've simply matched the different elements to predict the products. Let's see if our products are correct. Clearly, the copper is correct. It just exists as a single product, a single element. No worry about charges. We know that aluminum is usually three plus. We know that chlorine is negative one. Using the crisscross method, 
we end up with ALCL3. Products have been predicted. Let's balance it. Aluminum is fine. Copper is also fine. Chlorine, not so fine. There are two on the left and three on the right. So just as we did with an earlier uh, balancing question, we find the lowest common multiple. Again, there are two chlorines over here, three on the right. The lowest common multiple is three times two. So we want six on each side. For the copper chloride, we put three. For the aluminum chloride, we put two. In doing so, we now have six chlorines on the left and on the right. It's balanced. Unfortunately, though, we have also messed up the copper. Now, the copper has a three in front of it, which means there's three on the left and only one on the right. No worries, though. We can just put a three in front of it. Okay. Is there anything else we need to balance? The copper is fine. The chlorine is fine. Okay, so we're good. Wait. No, we're not. You didn't check the aluminum. On the product side, with, with the new balancing, we have two aluminums on the right. We have only one on the left. That's just the simplest putting a two in front. Okay. I would like everyone to try F on their own. So do the complete thing, state symbols. Oh wait, I forgot to do state symbols above. Let's just, let's just quickly do that, I apologize. <clears throat> Starting with aluminum chloride, the compound contains chloride. It is generally soluble. This is not an exception. AlCl3 is aqueous. And then finally, copper, it is not in a compound. You do not use the solubility rules you look at the periodic table. Copper by itself, black fawn, that's a metal, that's solid. Great. Right. Like I said, attempt F.
Take two more minutes. All right, 9.55, in the interest of time, the answer is 2 NaCl, and NaCl is aqueous, plus FeCO3. And if I remember correctly, uh, this is not an exception, uh, therefore it is aqueous. All right, on that one, CO3. No, I'm sorry, it is, it is insoluble, that's all right. Okay. I expected some people to have an issue with the iron. Uh, I don't know if you actually checked to make sure that the charges are balanced um, or if you didn't. If you didn't, you sort of lucked into the correct answer. But of, uh, of course, the problem here is as a transition metal, how do we know if this formula is right? Because transition metals, especially iron, can either be iron 2 plus or iron 3 plus. And you know, based on the rules of crisscross, two different ions leads to two different answers. So how do we know what the charge is of the iron here? Well, you know what the charge of the iron is in the reactant side. You know that chlorine in general is negative one. If there are two chlorines, that means it is two minus. To balance it out, that must mean that the iron is two plus. That is how you know what the charge of the iron is. I have given you enough information for you to deduce that for self. Do we have any questions on this? All right, let's take a five minute break. And we're going to come back and go into a lecture for the next topic. Uh, like I said, we're not going to complete this sheet today. We're probably going to continue on Thursday. We're going to head into a topic. Let's take a five-minute break. Reconvene at, let's say, 10.02. Okay, the recording <clears throat> has resumed. From the mic to be working. Let's start a new topic. All right. Ionic equations. In short, 
ionic equations can be defined as an abbreviated chemical equation that only shows what's important. How do we know uh, if something is important? Change in state symbols. Is, is important. Okay. Ionic equations are written by separating charged species aqueous species into individual ions. In general, only aqueous species are split never solid, never liquid, and never gas. So the only time you need to separate a species is if the species or molecule is aqueous. And of course, we know now how to identify a molecule as aqueous or not. <clears throat> so let's see what an ionic equation actually looks like. Uh, on the reactions 101 table I provided, under the heading neutralization, I don't remember which row that one was. Uh, let me just bring it up so I, can, uh, I don't say the wrong thing. Right, on the reactions a document I gave you, the quick handout, uh, looking at neutralization, that's the third row from the bottom. Uh, we're gonna do the first example. NaOH aqueous plus HCl, also aqueous, gives us H2O, which is a liquid. And finally, where's the other one? Ah, NaCl, which is also H. Whoops. All right. This equation, as is, is already balanced. So we don't need to worry about that. It is already has a state. Of, yeah. The equation is already balanced. It already has a state symbol, so we can go straight into it. This first, uh, this first equation is what's known as the total equation. We're first going to generate the complete ionic equation. To generate an ionic equation, I'll refer back to the instructions. You separate aqueous species into individual ions, and you only split it if it's aqueous. You do not split it for anything else. So how does that look here? From left to right, sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide is aqueous. So to split it, you literally write Na plus and OH minus. You have split the molecule to show which ions are participating, to show what charge each of those ions are. <clears throat> you 
then we move on to HCl by the same logic. This becomes H plus and Cl minus. Please note I'm trying to put as much space between the elements and the, and the, and the plus sign to make it clear when something is a positive charge versus a plus. Do note that I have not included the state symbols. By splitting the molecule, that is a direct implication that it is aqueous. So you do not need state symbols in this reaction because by splitting it, that directly implies that it's aqueous. All right. Next, we have H2O. H2O is a liquid. We do not split liquids. So this remains H2O. We keep the state symbol liquid because again, it is not obvious or directly implied like the charged species here. And in the last case, the last molecule, we have sodium positive and chlorine negative. This is the complete ionic equation. It shows all ions that are can participate, that are present, they show everything. And then finally, we have the net ionic equation. The net ionic equation works or is developed by deleting unchanged ions. These unchanged ions are referred to as spectator ions. I like to think of spectator ions exactly as it sounds. You know, the sporting competition, these ions are basically the audience. They are not actively participating in the sport, but their very presence helps the team play better. You are a spectator ion if you are unchanged from left to right. How do we know identify our unchanged? Well, let's start with the given complete reaction left to right. We have here sodium, which starts off as a positive ion, and it is aqueous. We know it's aqueous because it's split. In the product side, sodium is still positive. It is still aqueous. It is unchanged. So we eliminate it. Put a line through it like that. Keep it going. We have OH on the left, which is a charged anion and it is aqueous. It exists in the product as part of water. It is no longer charged. It is no longer aqueous. The HO has changed. You leave it alone. It is an, it is an athlete actually playing. H plus, same problem or same issue. The hydrogen in the product exists as a liquid. Therefore, it is changed. You do not split it. You do not eliminate it. So that stays there. Finally, we have chlorine. Chlorine on the left-hand side is charged and it's aqueous. On the right-hand side, it is charged and aqueous. It is a spectator ion and concomitantly deleted. Now that we've deleted the spectator ions, the net ionic equation is simply OH minus plus H plus to give you H2O. The net ionic equation simply shows you the important pieces of the reaction. In other words, if I were talking to a, to a chemist, if I'm talking to uh, someone in Gen Chem 2 and I tell them, yeah, this reaction, uh, this reaction is we're doing a neutralization. They're like, oh, that's the one that forms water. That's why we can always state it. If you look at the reactions 101 sheet beside neutralization under comments, 
you'll see I say I say it occurs when water and a, and a salt is formed and an ionic compound is formed. This is the ionic equation. So we can have ionic equations for pretty much anything, right? Because it's just one way of representing what's important, what's actually happening. So let's take one of the previous examples we did. Actually, yeah, let's, let's start with this first one, A. Oh, that was a problem. Yeah, okay, let me take a screenshot of it. That's such an idiot. Take a screenshot. Yeah. Whoops. Yep, there it is. All right, so all I've done is this uh, uh, collected the equation we did earlier. We are going to generate the net ionic equation for this reaction. It is already balanced. It has all of the state symbols correct. So we're just gonna go straight into it. We write the complete ionic equation first because it allows us to identify the ions present. From left to right, we split aqueous species and we end up with Li plus OH minus plus Ba2 plus Cl minus to give us lithium plus Cl minus Ba2 plus. And I always run out of space with this topic, so bear with me here. and OH minus. All of them are aqueous species, so we split all of them. It should bother some of you that you're saying, wait a second, this something seems off here. I don't think this is correct. You have not incorporated the balanced numbers. All we have done so far is split them up. Now we must incorporate the balanced numbers. On the left-hand side, we know that there are two of the entire molecule. Therefore, technically speaking, there are two lithium plus and two OH minus. You have to put the two for each ion because otherwise, if you wrote it in front like this, as is, you are simply telling me that there are two lithiums and only one OH. That is incorrect. So it needs to be explicitly clear. To keep it going, we do the same thing for the lithium chloride right here. And then for the hydroxide at the end, we put a two in front of it. I saw a hand earlier. Was that a, was it, did I answer it? That's just how I write. You can write it however you want. I don't care. I just like writing it like this. Okay. We do not need state symbols because by separating the species, that is a direct implication. So now we can go through and eliminate. Starting with lithium, we start <clears throat> with lithium charged aqueous. We end up lithium charged aqueous. Eliminate it. OH, we started off charged aqueous, we end up charged aqueous, we eliminate. Barium starts off charged aqueous, it ends up charged aqueous, eliminate. Chlorine minus and chlorine minus stays the same, you eliminate. So technically speaking, no net ionic equation exists. I know we've described it as saying what's important. So I'm not saying that this reaction is not important. The technical definition of important is change in state symbol. So no net ionic equation isn't saying, you know, there's nothing important in general. It simply says there is no change in state symbol. 
That is what I hear if someone tells me, yeah, no net ionic equation exists. Forgot to let me know the ones on the right. So it is possible for some reactions not to have an ionic equation because again, it simply comes down to their individual states. All right, let's try another one that we did. All right, next one up, this reaction right here. Already balanced, already stayed symboled, everything's good. Going from left to right, we're going to split aqueous species. We're going to consider balancing what we have in total is for the complete. We have two Na plus CO3 two minus plus Fe two plus two Cl minus to give us two Na plus. 2Cl minus. And then finally, we do not split the iron carbonate as it is solid. I've also uh, ensured that I'm considering the balance, the number of each element. <sighs> Notice that sodium carbonate has two sodiums, so that must be reflected in the complete ionic equation. Similarly speaking, there's only one carbonate, so you don't need to write a one. Okay, from there, we're going to go through and identify the spectator ions. Uh, starting with sodium, it starts charged aqueous, it ends up charged aqueous. That will be eliminated. The carbonate starts charged aqueous, it's solid in the product, it does change. It is left alone. Iron starts off charged aqueous. It ends up as part of a solid. There is a change. You leave it alone. In the case of chlorine, <clears throat> chlorine starts charged and ends up charged or remains charged. It is a spectator ion. Therefore, it is deleted. The net ionic equation is therefore CO3 2 minus. plus Fe2 plus, and that gives us iron carbonate. On an exam, I can either ask you to provide the complete ionic equation, or I can ask you to provide the net ionic equation. This depends on the question. Any questions on this? Okay. I would like for you all to try F. F is what you did earlier. And in fact, you can actually write it on the worksheet because page seven onwards is where I put the space for the net ionic equations. Uh, you can see the instruction says here, provide the complete nationic equations for all reactions from problem three. So there is, that, there is designated space for you to write the answer if you'd like. But if you want to do it on your scratch paper, that's also okay. But again, I'm asking for the net ionic equation of reaction F. Oh, wait, no, we just did that one. Uh, let's do reaction D. I apologize, reaction D. Take uh, like three minutes. You have a question? Uh, this should be a two minus height, right? Two plus? No, because if they're charged, that is a direct implication that they're aqueous. Okay. So it's just not necessary. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 
No, H2 is a diatomic element. That's how it naturally exists. Right. So it has to be H2. You'd, have, you'd, you'd be responsible for the same thing if it was like oxygen, right? right. It's not just O, it's O2. If a quick way to remember it is all of the reds uh, on the periodic table exist as twos. Yes, let me come over there. Yeah. Did I that was yeah. maybe a typo on the yeah. notes? I can double check it. Yeah, it should be just like you have two OH. There should be should be two CL. I'll double check, but I missed it. Take another minute. Is there having trouble distinguishing between a cation and an anion? Is, it um, is there a particular one you're working on right now? Like, for example, this one. Like, how do you know about the anion? Okay, that's good. So, can you just look for your notes somewhere? Because... <clears throat> Sorry. Ah. Group number, ideal charge. Aluminum is in group three slash 13. Group three has an ideal charge of plus three. Oh. That's how you know it's positive. Same idea for the chlorine. Chlorine is in group seven. Ideal charge is negative one. So, so that's an chlorine anion. That's correct. Right. The only one that should be like unknown to you is which one were you looking at? Right, this one. Yeah, the copper. Copper is a transition metal, so you don't actually know what charge it is, but no matter what, it's going to be positive. Got to remember the yeah. lecture. Oh, that that's is. how you know. Okay. Hopefully, by now we have gotten it done. Let me just take this and we'll go through it piece by piece so everyone understands the flow. Uh, and if there are any questions, we can of course answer them immediately. Okay, this reaction is already balanced. It already has a state symbol. So we just uh, go accordingly. First, let's do the complete ionic equation. To do so, we split the aqueous species starting from left to right. First and foremost, aluminum is not aqueous. You don't split it. This is simply two Al salt. Next up, we have copper chloride, which is aqueous. So you do split it and you must remember the balancing. There are three copper ions. And there are six chlorine ions. Remember, part of copper chloride is CuCl2. There are three of this molecule. So there are actually six chlorines in total. Similarly uh, speaking, copper is a transition metal. So you would not be able to look at the periodic table and just tell the charge. However, you do know that chlorine is negative one. If there are two chlorines, that means you have in total negative two. This implies that the copper must be two plus. Okay. We do not need state symbols here because by separating it, that is a direct implication that it's aqueous. On the product side, we now have two Al three plus, six Cl minus, and then the copper stays the same because it is not aqueous. Again, note that I have considered the charges, considered the balancing. Going through to eliminate spectator ions, first up, aluminum starts off solid, it ends up charged. That is a change in state. That is a change in state, you leave it alone. Copper starts off charged aqueous, it ends up 
solid. That is a change. You leave it alone. The chlorine starts charged aqueous. It ends up charged aqueous. That is eliminated. Therefore, in total, the ionic, the net ionic equation is 2Al solid plus 3 copper 2 plus gives you 2Al 3 plus plus 3 Cu solid. Okay. Do we have any questions on this? All right. Let's move on to our next topic. All right. Next up, we have reduction oxidation. AKA redox, R E D O X. A redox reaction, a reduction oxidation reaction, uh, involves the direct transfer of electrons. Again, my electron is abbreviated with an E and a apostrophe over it. So <clears throat> from one reactant to another. The direct transfer. The term direct transfer implies one reactant will lose electrons The other reactant gains electrons. There's a direct transfer. One reactant must lose, one reactant must gain. If a reaction loses electrons, I'm sorry, if a reactant loses electrons, it is said to be oxidized. If a reactant gains electrons, it is said to be reduced. In other words, if this is a direct transfer in which one reactant loses electrons and the other has to gain those electrons, the implication is reduction and oxidation must occur together. You will never have a reaction that is just reduction. You will never have a reaction that is just oxidation. They have to both happen. One reactant will gain, one reactant will lose. The mnemonic frequently used is oil rig. The acronym oil rig stands for oxidation is loss of electrons and reduction is gain of electrons. Oil rig. Another way of describing these two, in the case of oxidation, if it loses electrons, the ion gets more positive. In the case of reduction, the ion gets more negative. 
This should make some intuitive sense. If in reduction you're gaining electrons and the electrons are negative, if you're gaining electrons, you're becoming more negative. This is represented in charge numbers. In the case of the ion getting more positive, uh, the charge oh God. Charge on ion increases. And in the case of negative, uh, the charge on ion decreases. And then the final note. It's right there on the tip of my tongue. Yes. Elements in their reference states, and by reference, I mean normal or naturally occurring, their reference states. have a charge of zero. Okay. Let's see what this looks like. And let's to analyze some reduction oxidation reactions using ones that we've already looked at. So let's first do the aluminum and copper chloride reaction. We just balanced and did the uh, net ionic earlier. Okay, that goes two, three, three, two. All right. And I, of course, I have balanced the reaction. I always need to judge how much space I need. Cool. Okay. Let's try to identify if this reaction is a redox reaction. And if it is, uh, how do we know? What information can we glean from? It? So looking at the individual compounds and elements, first on the left, we have here aluminum. Aluminum is not in a compound, therefore it's an element. Looking at the periodic table, aluminum is in black font, which means it naturally exists as a solid, as a metal. Its state symbol is solid, therefore it is in its natural or reference state. As a result, it has a charge of zero. This should make sense. This, this aluminum is not in a compound. It hasn't been given a chance to form an ion yet. It's just zero. All right, looking at the next compound, let's start with chlorine because we know, uh, we know what the charge is. The exact charge of a single chlorine is negative one. All I'm looking at is to know the charge. Technically, yes, there are two chlorines, so it would have the overall negative two, but all I want to know is what the specific charge is of a single chlorine. That's just negative one. We've already analyzed this, but we know that the copper must be two plus. All right. Now let's see if this charge information is maintained or if it changes or what on the product side. First up here, we have aluminum, aluminum chloride. Again, we know that chlorine is in group seven. So each chlorine has a negative one charge. Aluminum is now part of a compound. 
It is now part of a compound, which means it has to be an ion. It has to be a cation. Looking at the periodic table, aluminum is in group three. Therefore, it has a charge of three plus. Notice the difference. On the left-hand side, aluminum exists by itself as a solid. That is its reference, normal, naturally occurring state. It has a charge of zero. But on the product side, it is not in its natural occurring state. It is part of chlorine. It's aqueous. In that case, you use your regular rules. You identify the charge. And then finally, copper exists by itself. According to the periodic table, it is a metal. Therefore, it is solid. Copper has a zero charge. All right. Going through each atom one at a time, uh, if we were to summarize it, we know that aluminum becomes Al3+. All I'm doing is summarizing the changes. Copper starts off 2 plus and it ends up neutral slash zero. And then finally, the chlorine starts negative one. It ends up negative one. I have simply rewritten the different elements to summarize their changes to make it easier for us to see. Aluminum turns to three plus. Did aluminum lose electrons or gain electrons? It lost electrons. We know it lost electrons because it became positive. We know it loses electrons because that's what we've been talking about since the beginning of this class. Group three loses electrons. According to our rules, oxidation is the loss of electrons. Therefore, the aluminum is oxidized. Again, we see this because we have deduced, based on the charges, it had to have lost electrons. Specifically, it lost three electrons, specifically. Oxidation is loss of electrons, it's oxidized. The other way you could have identified this is based on the charge. When it comes to oxidation, the charge on the ion increases. Again, remember, aluminum started off at zero, it ends up three plus. That is the other way you could have identified this is oxidized. Next up, we have copper. Copper starts off two plus, it becomes neutral. The only way for that to happen is if it gained two electrons. That is the only way for a charged species to become neutral. Okay, it's not oxidized, it is reduced. Again, the same conclusion is met. The charge decreases, it goes from two to zero. That's one way to look at it. The other way is to know that it gained electrons. It is reduced. Finally, the chlorine doesn't do anything. The chlorine doesn't change. To be quite frank, it's just there. It is not a spectator ion. It is, we do not eliminate. This, that was ionic equations. This is redox. It is just there. We don't care about it. All right. With that now in mind, we have analyzed the reaction. I'm just going to put this down a bit. And let's answer some questions about it. The different reactants are aluminum and copper chloride. First thing I want to know, which one is oxidized, which one is reduced? We have actually already discovered this. We know from now already 
the aluminum is oxidized. The copper is reduced. You may be wondering, well, if the copper is what's reduced, why are we including the chlorine? Did we already say that the chlorine was just there? Technically speaking, the copper is part of a compound. So you do have to label the entire compound. But you and I both know specifically the copper is being reduced. Next. We're introducing the term uh, agents. It is said that the element that is oxidized is known as the reducing agent. In the same way, the element or compound that is reduced is called the oxidizing agent. It's a little bit confusing because we've already described them as reduced or oxidized. In fact, they're opposite. This is not really clicking for us. The idea behind agents is if aluminum is losing electrons, something has to cause it to lose electrons. In the same way, if the copper is gaining electrons, something has to cause it to gain electrons. By the process of elimination, if aluminum is being oxidized, it cannot also be the oxidizing agent. In other words, this is oxidized and this is the agent that oxidizes. Similarly speaking, the copper is reduced, the Al, the aluminum causes the reduction. So it's more of a bookkeeping method, just trying to make sure that we understand the role of each element or molecule. The aluminum gets oxidized. The aluminum forces reduction. Do we have any questions on that? All right. And then on, same under the guise of oxidation reduction, you must also be able to generate half reactions. Half reactions in general focus on change in charge. Nothing else needed. There are two types of half reactions. There is the oxidation half reaction. And then there is the reduction half reaction. As I just said, the half reactions specifically focus on the change in charge. Let's do the oxidation first. Going back to that equation we know that aluminum is what was oxidized. In fact, it, tur it started neutral, it ended up aluminum three plus. We have already discussed that the only way for this to happen is for the aluminum to lose three electrons. If the aluminum loses electrons, does that mean the electron is a product of this reaction or a reactant? Think about the progress of time. If we're losing electrons and we're starting neutral, are those electrons reactants or products? Products. Because if I were to write it on the reactant side, I'm saying, well, we're giving aluminum three electrons. However, if I write it on the product side, I am clearly saying aluminum forms three plus, and three electrons are formed as a byproduct. 
This is the half reaction for the oxidation. It clearly shows which element is being oxidized, clearly shows the charge, this change in charge, and it clearly shows how many electrons are associated with it. From just this alone, you know aluminum is going to display something, end up in a compound. For the reduction, it's the same idea. Over here, we know, we already noted it down, Reduction is the copper two plus turning into copper neutral. We've already discussed that reduction is gain of electrons. So in this case, will the electrons be on the reactant side or the product side? The reactant side. Specifically two electrons. Specifically two. And again, we know that it's two because the copper is two plus. And how do we know the copper is two plus? Because we used chlorine to deduce. So all of what you've learned in the first module is kind of blending all together. It's going to get overwhelming. I totally understand that. So please take your time with these questions. We're gonna be doing a lot of practice with this until our next exam, right? But patience and practice is your best friend on this. Yeah. Cool. Do we understand the significance and how to identify their half reactions? Great. We're not technically done yet because this reaction is balanced. We must reflect that balancing in the half reactions. I've, we've already discussed this is balanced. We already know that. We know that there are two aluminum. So technically, I just need to put two in front of this case. Is there anything else I might need to change in this very same reaction? If I'm multiplying the whole thing by two, is there something I'm missing to multiply by two? No, the charge stays the same. To the right of the charge is the electrons. Let's do that again. There are two aluminums in total. Previously, we decided or discovered, well, this is the single half reaction for a single aluminum atom in this reaction. But there isn't two aluminum atoms. I'm sorry, there isn't just one aluminum atom, is there? There's two. So you will have two aluminum forming two cations and in total, six electrons will be lost. We can apply this logic to the reduction from the already balanced equation. We know that there is a three in front of it. So we just write it back. In this case, we get three copper, three copper. And what happens to the electrons? Also multiplied by three to give us six. So you remember earlier I said, redox involves a direct transfer of electrons. One reactant gains, one reactant loses. From this equation, you can see aluminum loses six electrons. And those same six electrons get added to the copper. That is why balancing the half reactions is also important because it clearly states and shows where those electrons are coming from and how many are there in total. Let's try another one. Trying to pick, oh yes, I got one. Okay, we're gonna do two more questions. First up, we are combining strontium and oxygen to form SRO. 
This is a fictitious reaction I'm giving you. It is not on any of the worksheets. I'm going to tell you that strontium is a solid, oxygen is a gas. Um, and then finally, SRO, I believe, is aqueous. All right. The question we ask is ultimately going to come back to the table. We know that the table is really going to refer to the two reactants. Here we have SR and O2, so we can already sort of bracket them off. The first thing we want to know is which one is oxidized or reduced. That is the first thing we want to know. Looking at the molecules, we see here that on the left-hand side, we have elements. Looking at the periodic table at SR as in strontium, it is naturally a metal. It is a solid. This is its reference state. It has a charge of zero. Next up, oxygen. Oxygen is one of those diatomic elements I've taught you. That is, it exists as O2, not O. O2 as a gas is its naturally occurring form, zero. Looking at the product now, the product is clearly a compound. They've combined. If we look at the charges, strontium, which is in group two, is now two plus. Oxygen, which is in group six, two minus. Charges are balanced. Everything's good. All right. Looking at strontium. Strontium starts at zero and ends up two plus. Is this gain or loss of electrons? Loss. And if you've lost electrons, according to Eulerig, it is oxidized. Once you figured out one, process of elimination tells you that the oxygen is reduced, right? That's the beauty of this. They have to both occur. If you know one is oxidized, that must mean the other is reduced. <laughs> Next, I'd like you to then identify the agent, or rather what type of agent they are, all right? Well, the strontium is oxidized and causes the reduction. So in this case, the strontium is the reducing agent. Again, by process of elimination, therefore this means the oxygen is the oxidizing agent. Hopefully, yes. Because strontium, as written here, is not in a compound, so it's just an element. So you look at the periodic table, strontium is a metal. Right here, it's a solid. So it's an element that exists in its natural occurring state. According to the rules, um, elements in their reference or normal state have a charge of zero, just as the aluminum did here, and the copper. And then finally, I want you to tell me the half or generate the half reactions. Don't worry, we're going to do that together. Half reactions. Okay. Starting with strontium, we know that strontium is oxidized. So where must the electrons be on the product side or the reactant side? It's oxidized. If you're losing electrons, will it be on the product side or the reactant side? Product side. Very good. So we know that this is SR is going to turn into SR2 plus, plus two electrons. See, we've already identified the strontium is oxidized. So we've just written that as one of, we know that SR turns into SR2 plus. Now we need to understand, okay, how many electrons are involved and where do they go? We know from the specific charge that two electrons are involved. And if you're losing electrons, it must be formed as a byproduct. 
In the case of oxygen, of course, oxygen starts off neutral, it ends up O2. It ends up, sorry, O minus, O2 minus, which means it had to have gained two electrons. Okay. Now for good measure, we need to check to see if our equation is balanced. You have a choice. You can either try to balance the half reactions first or balance the original reaction. I'm going to recommend you always balance the original reaction first. So coming back up here, let's quickly balance this. Strontium is fine. One on the left, one on the right. Oxygen is not fine. There, <laughs> There's two on the left and one on the right. To balance this, we simply put Now we have balanced the oxygens, but unintentionally, what have we done? We're now saying that there are two strontiums on the right and only one strontium on the left. That's a quick fix though. We just put a two in front of it. Now that we have balanced the original reaction, we must now reflect that in the half reaction. We know that there are two strontiums in total. So we multiply this thing by two, we get two. Two and four electrons total. Oxygen didn't need any further balancing, so there's only one. But technically speaking, O2 means that there are two oxygen atoms. And each oxygen atom gains two electrons. So what should I more accurately have here? Four. All right, so I'll, I'll repeat myself to make it clear. We balanced the strontium half reaction based on the original equation. When balancing that, we now see, okay, four electrons are involved. So where do those four electrons go? Earlier, before I made the correction, I had two over here on the right. The fact that this was two and this was four should have been the red flag to say, I need to fix the oxygen. There's something off about it. Because remember, electrons are transferred. If four electrons are lost, those four electrons have to go somewhere. Looking at the product, looking at the oxygen again, just again, making it clear. There are two oxygen atoms and each oxygen gains two electrons. As a result, we have gained in total four electrons. And this lines up with the half reaction for strontium. This is it. This table tells you everything you need to know. And it's how I would ask you a question. I would say using the reactants, identify which is reduced oxidized, identify the agents, and then identify the half reaction. Okay. Uh, it's 11 o'clock. So let's call it there for today. Uh, the, now we're on chapter seven, I believe. It's all kind of blended together because it's kind of a two-parter. Next time we uh, meet on Thursday, we're going to continue this worksheet I will not be bringing more worksheets, so please carry your own. Uh, I've also uploaded it to Canvas, so if you'd like to reprint it, that's fine with me, but I will not be supplying these worksheets on Thursday. Uh, when we come on Thursday, we're gonna try to do as much of the rest of the worksheet as possible, uh, especially the ionic equations and the strong and the, and the redox. Feel free to attempt it if you wanna practice, but we are going to go through it on Thursday and, and finish up this worksheet. For everyone else, we will meet, we will begin lab at 11.20 exactly. For everyone else, I'll see you on Thursday. Have a good day.